This week on CrossFeed. Jedi under attack. Hey Christians, stop taking care of our orphans. Do you have a permit for that church? When did Jesus become God? And atheist pastors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. Hey, good to have everybody here tonight. I'm trying to figure out why every time I introduce myself, and then you go to introduce yourself, I disappear for a second. Hmm. Your, uh, your picture gets less clear. It, it actually gets a little... It's something with the camera or with the recording, because it, it, it downgrades, because your picture gets a little fuzzier. But it always happens right at that moment. I sense a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. All right. A vast right-wing conspiracy. Okay. I'm not even going to go. You know what it is? You don't have a permit for this podcast. That's not uh, oh. This is true. Nice segue. <laughs> so, yeah, that's God's way of telling you you don't have a, have a permit. Um, so there's a, a couple of um, a couple stories, actually. Um, one is in um, <clears throat> Gilbert, Arizona, and the other one is uh, down in Southern California, Rancho Cucamonga. Man, Man I, I love that name. <laughs> I love that name, Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, uh, and uh, both of them have got issues with home Bible study groups meeting. Um, and this one is called Oasis of Truth. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> So uh, a, a Gilbert compliance officer hit the church with a violation notice about it. Um, it says that Bible studies, church leadership meetings, and fellowship activities are not permitted in private homes. Uh, and the Alliance Defense Fund, uh, which is a conservative religious legal group, uh, says it will sue if they don't overturn this. And the other case was... Um, Tough them, boys. We're putting this dirt uh, bag away. <laughs> I'll be back on the street in 24 hours. We'll try to make it 12. Yeah. It's pretty a while. Uh, Shiloh Tabernacle Church, run by Purity Hillary Ministries Incorporated. And they stress miracles of healing, deliverance from demonic oppression, and uh, possession, rededications, and most importantly, salvations. And, I've never uh, seen that as a plural before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, this is the one in Cucamonga. Uh but uh, And they need to get a conditional use permit by Good Friday to operate a church in a residential area. And uh, they're, um, they're being represented by a group called Pacific Justice Institute, um, which said it's a Bible study that usually draws about 15 people. But um, the uh, uh, neighbors are saying it's 40 to 60 people. He said they said... Um. Yeah. I, uh, all right. So here's the problem with, with both of these. Uh, we don't have all the information. You know, for instance, this conflicting amount. You know, because I can understand if they're having 40, 50 people in there every week, I can understand the neighbors being upset. This could be a parking problem, and traffic problem, you know, all kinds of things. If they're having 15 people over, you know, total. Uh, now, if it's 15 people plus their families, you know, their kids or whatever, then that can add up pretty fast. But if it's a total of 15 people that they're having over once a week, unless this is a really small or narrow street or something like that, you know, I, I can't see that being a huge problem. Um, now, this other one, it yeah, says... The yeah. The Arizona one, it says that, um, that no neighbors complained. Um this, nope. uh, at least according to the Alliance Defense Fund, that it was simply, it was a um, police officer saw the sign that they were doing this, and so he slapped a fine on him without even, you right. know, seeing if it was a problem. Yeah, not not a police officer, a code compliance officer. Oh. So, okay. somebody who would work for the city, not a cop. All right. Good point. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, um, 
<clears throat> I think I think on the one hand they I think they have the right to gather. I think the other hand, um, there is a uh, good neighbors here. Uh, you know, you want in part of the church the idea is that you want to reach out to people, and you know by you know this kind of stuff that you're you know okay how do how do you handle this? I think if it's a I think the one group there, this uh, Oasis of Truth group, again, it doesn't even say how bad at large it is. It just says the town code bars religious assemblies in private homes. That is, that is, if that is what it says, that is frankly unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're not allowed to have know. Bible study in your home. So parents, don't you know, sit down and have evening Bible study with your kids. <laughs> Well, a, a Bible study, a church leadership meeting, so you're, you're not, supposedly can't have your, your elders over your home for a meeting, yeah. uh, or fellowship activities. So, you know, I can't have the youth group over to my house to, to, to have a swim party. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know. Or, or, or you know, if I want to get, you know, a bunch of people over for a cookout or something like that. Or for that matter, right. what if I want to have an elders meeting and, oh, let's, you know, since we're all coming for this meeting, why don't we come a little early and have a cookout or, you know, or something and um, and we'll have some fun and then we'll have our meeting. Or Nope, that's right. not allowed. Give me a break. So it's okay. I mean, you know, it's okay to have a Super Bowl party, but if it's a member of the church having a bunch of people for his church over for a Super Bowl party, <laughs> that's not allowed? Well, yeah, and even the NFL would be okay with it if as long as you don't call it a Super Bowl party. <laughs> you know, that's, that's true. <laughs> but uh yeah, it, it's yeah, that that that's that's overly narrow. Uh, this other place it real I think it would depend on the size of the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, now this one guy says, you know, he goes, well, they don't require permits for, you know, everything from birthday parties to weekend beer bash. That's probably true. But on the other hand, the birthday parties and the weekend beer bash don't take place every weekend. Right. Yeah. Or, or, you know, on a regular basis. And now, again, I don't know how often they're meeting. Uh, it says uh, a weekly. Yeah, they were gathering weekly. Mm-hmm. So if it's, a, if it's a weekly thing, yeah, you know, it could be an issue. Uh, right. Now, this isn't quite the same. But uh, when I was growing up, there was a church that uh, started. And I knew the pastor. I, the pastor's son and daughter went to, to junior high with me. And uh, I mean, I hung out with them, um, and I mean, I don't know where, what, how, how it started, but this thing just, just exploded. Actually, it's almost a mini denomination in Kansas City now. Um, if anybody in Kansas City, they've heard of Full Faith Church of Love, and this is before satellite congregations got to be the big thing. They were already doing satellite congregations, so they had Full Faith North, Full Faith South. I mean, they were all over the place. Well, anyway, like a three million dollar facility they eventually built. It was, it was just incredible. Uh, what they did. But anyway, um, they quickly outgrew the building they were in and uh, ate the parking lot. And they were parking all up and down the street. And there was this sign that actually said, no parking on street except Sundays. Well, I'm going to tell you, you had these people parked on both sides of the street. And you were trying to maneuver through that every Sunday. And, you know, it's basically because they kind of ate up both both sides, it was almost about a lean and a half that was left. Which meant that if you were coming down and somebody's coming the other way, it was kind of like, okay, which of us is going to back up into a driveway? Hmm. Because we both can't go on this road right now with all these cars. So I could understand their complaint. Yeah. You know, again, depending on how many. Right. Right. And yeah, and like Jim said, you know, <laughs> you don't want to antagonize your neighbors. You're trying to reach out to them and you know, and love them. <laughs> it's just not a good thing to do is to, you know, irritate and annoy them. <laughs> right. You know, um, I mean, seriously, I mean, it's, maybe it's a good question to ask, but, you know, questions like that. Like how, you know, how far do we go in turning the other cheek in a situation like this? You know, I mean, you know, is it the Christian thing to say, look, we have a right uh, the beer bashes are going on. You're not saying anything. Why is it something wrong for us? Well, you know, that's or a good do we point. sit back? Okay, you know what? Or, or do we sit back and say, on the other hand, look, we want to be good neighbors. Therefore, we're willing to go the extra mile. You know, and if this, if this, you know, is really causing you some heartburn, we'll try to find someplace else to meet. Mm-hmm. Diagon Alley. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, well, you it's know, not the even, Arizona yeah. one, no, if the guy's right, no, no neighbors were complaining. Right. So that appears not to be an issue. I mean, I think there's, it, it depends on exactly what it says, but if, if the statement is accurate, then it's overly broad and it should be struck down as unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. The, the Rucho, Rancho Cucamonga, I think, though, the way you have neighbors complaining, then you, you know, need, you need to say, okay, how can we, what kind of accommodations can we make? You know, we want to be good neighbors. Matter of fact, we'd like you to come and join us. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so what do we need to do here? Yeah. So, but yeah, if, if nobody's complaining and you have this sort of poorly worded law, you know, <laughs> then it's a matter of, um, I mean, they could... I don't. Yeah, they just need to rewrite the law or, or strike it down or or whatever. Because, um, you know, I I guess I've always said if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, and it doesn't appear that that whatever's going on in this neighborhood is broke until somebody starts complaining. And uh, so, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things that go on in communities that the community's perfectly happy that it's going on, even though technically. Um, because the law is written weirdly or something, it's it's not supposed to be allowed. But if everybody's okay with it, then well, it's not hurting anybody. You know, <laughs> so if somebody wants to complain, then they can deal with it. Yeah. So I don't know. You'd no, think they'd I'll... feel differently if it was a Jedi walking around in a hood. I don't know. I was I was uh, right. I think that was a good one to come to. Yeah, uh, we've talked about the Church of the Jedi once. And as I recall, we got some kind of negative feedback from them. Yeah, <laughs> they and we apologize. For our attitude. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they didn't quite realize that we are just can be as unserious and sarcastic as we can be. But anyway, I mean, no, uh, that's okay. I'll 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 poke fun at my own church too. You know, I'll, I'll you know it, that's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we're Missouri sinners, man. We know how to make fun of our own. We know how to make fun of our own. We, we do well. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, there's this job center. This is in uh, uh, in England, in somewhere in Britain. And uh, this guy, member of the name of in the International Church of Jediism. Uh, <clears throat> his name is Chris uh, Jarvis, a, yeah. but they don't give his Jedi name. Yeah, I was like, yeah, the, yeah they give him cool Jedi names. So, and he's 31 years old. Anyway, so he's wearing his hood in this place. Which is against the rules because it's, it's a safety and, and protection thing. That is, people who have hoods up are, you know, oftentimes don't want to be recognized. And um, so, anyway, uh, but the Church of Jediism has a doctrine that states that he- followers should be allowed to wear hoods. Don't get technical with me. And yeah. so he filed a complaint. All right. So there's sort of two sides to this. All right, their argument is Muslims can walk around in whatever religious gear they like, so why can't I? Okay. Now, that's your, if if they're going to allow, uh, you know, the Muslim, uh, what do you call them, hijabs or the, the sort of... Headscarves. Head, yeah, headscarves. Um, you know, there's a name for that, but, um, you know, if they're going to allow that... But then, I, I, I won't say what you would call it, so that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm sure... I'm sure you have some sort of tor- terrible thing to call it. So oh, I'm sure. You know. um, but uh, you know, this—I mean, this guy—he's wearing a hoodie. You know, I mean, it's—it's it's not like it's not like this is some you know like um, like you know the emperor where he kind of wears that thing and, like all you can see is his mouth. You know, I mean, this guy—he's just—it's—it's it's just a hood. You can see his face. You know, so well, I understand. You know, the the security concern. Okay. Because like when I go into the bank, I have to take a hat off. I don't usually wear a hat, so it's not a big deal. But you do you have you have to wear it, take your hat off, okay? But um, and so he's saying, look, if if they're allowed to wear these, then I should be allowed to too. And to that, I have to say, eh, yeah, I, I have to side with him on that. Uh, at well, the same time, no, he says, uh, go ahead. Well, at, at the same time, the other side is their doctrine states that followers should be allowed to wear hoods. And I'm trying to figure out, did they just word that strangely? Because that's like sort of like saying, you know, our our doctrine states that our followers should be allowed to wear, you know, uh, necklaces or something like that. It doesn't say they have to. 
And I'm pretty sure that the Jedi doctrine doesn't dictate specifically that they have to, that, but they should, if they want to, you know? Um, but like, for instance, with the Sikh religion, if I remember right, that little dagger that they wear, that's not actually sharpened or anything. We talked about that in the past. Um, with that, it's, they have to, it's, it's part of their, you know, it, it, you're not a good Sikh if you're not wearing this. Um, or, um, for a woman to have, uh, her, uh, headscarf off in, as a Muslim, I mean, right. Muslim women must wear them. That right. is a must. Well, see, yeah, you came to the exact same point that I did where it says, again, their tailor should be allowed to wear hoods. Now, of course, it says here that, you know, their, their Jedi religion is based on the, um, um, the, uh, uh, sci-fi film. And I'm a, you know, have watched Star Wars probably. He's 31, a Chris. You know, I, I, I'm not even sure you were, well, let's see. Uh, 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 78. What? Uh, he, he had nine years to show up first, but you get four showed up and I saw my first one. Okay. I was there in 77, saw it first row. Okay. I'm a bit of a, you know, Star Wars aficionado here. I can tell you from watching it, not all Jedi wear hoods all the time. In fact, a lot of them, when they go inside, take them off. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And Yoda never wore uh, one. How many hoods did... Yeah, Yoda never wore, wore one. It would look really uh, weird uh, with the big ears, you know. Yeah. Uh, and other than going into uh, uh, Jabba's palace for, at the beginning, Luke never wore one either. Yeah. Yeah, it was just but the one time he was cool doing cool it black. as a disguise. Yeah, but he wore that uh, really cool black faux uh, clergy garb there at the, on the last one. Yeah. Wasn't... But, uh, is it... Isn't the only one that ever the only ones that ever kept their hoods on all the time were the Sith Lords? Ah, uh, that could be. Yep. Because but anyway, the key is yeah. is it's they don't have to have to. And that's the difference. And that's why it's not, you know, they can walk around in whatever gear they like, but whatever gear they're required to wear. Right. But anyway, I just kind of, you know, the the Wendy Fleurs, who's the uh I guess was the uh um uh, the, the the job centers plus branches boss said we are committed to providing customer service which respects diversity and respects uh, embraces diversity and respects customers religion. Uh, so she apologized to this uh, for this. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Jedi, but uh, I think that's being silly. You know. Uh, you know, if you can show me where the movies, they always wore hoods all the time and were required to, then I will retract my thought that it's silly. But I don't remember. Well, uh, look, for that matter, if if you can show me in your own teachings, you know, that you have something written down that says they're required. If this, you know, if this article's wrong, okay, fine. Now, that you know, that's how we've talked about Jedis before. I would love... To have, and we've been contacted by them before. I'd love to have, if, if any of the, um, the, you know, so Jedi proponents, um, are, are out there, if you'd like to come on our show, uh, send us a note, crossfeed at, or, uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com, and we'll see what we can work out. Uh, it's going to be some time zone differences because most of the Jedi are in England. Um, but if, if we can work it out, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Cause I'd love to have you on talk about, you know, what what your what you guys believe and stuff? I think a lot of people aren't real familiar with it. Well, they've seen the movies, but not real familiar with the the sort of religion that's that's um, come off it and stuff. And um, so, really, seriously, would love to have you on the show. I think that would make for a really interesting show. And Darth Maul took off his helmet. He took off his hood, so not even the Sith were required to have. Well, he was an apprentice. Off. I mean, well, Vader, well, Vader had a mask, so it's hard to say, but the, the Emperor, uh, Palpatine, um, it, whenever he was acting as a Sith Lord, always had his hood up. Yeah, but, uh, there's only one Sith Lord, one apprentice, so, you know, you, you, but, uh, so I don't know what you could say about, uh, so that's uh, true, Vader was more of a, an apprentice. There. 
He was a permanent apprentice. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, 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 but, uh, 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 but I, I think Darth Sidious did it mostly, A, to hide his, uh, um, who he was when he, um, in the earlier movies. And then, uh, I think because his face was so disfigured. But anyway. Maybe they there. should have um, required him to take his hood off. To re- okay. <laughs> Sorry. That, now, what if there are Jedi that don't really believe? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> if you only knew the power of the dark side. Okay. <laughs> this is um there well, was you a study think you're a Jedi or something. Of, <laughs> uh, there's this guy by the name of Daniel uh, Dennett. And he's a professor of philosophy and co director of the Center for Cognitive Stor- Studies at Tufts University. And he uh, he put up a twenty eight page study of Non-believing clergy. Yeah, I didn't read the whole thing either. <laughs> okay. Um, now, this sounds really weird, but these people have been running around, especially in liberal Christianity, for some time. Um, I mean, when I my first my first church uh, there in Rockford, Illinois, there's this guy there. He was the pastor of a, another Lutheran church in the area, not Missouri Synod. And I remember sitting with him, and he's like. Uh, you, you really think he rose from the dead? If you had a video camera there, you really thought you would have seen a body come out of that out of the grave? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> uh, there was an Episcopalian I one time read about uh, in an article by uh, George Plant, who used to be uh, the uh, religion editor at the, the Cleveland Plain Dealer out near Neck of the Woods. Uh, he was a very, very famous religion co- art author and he had a, an article one time i read and uh well they talked about the same thing clergy who don't believe and this guy was episcopalian and he said uh and he asked us well, what do you do during the creed he goes i, I always say they believe Thank you. i believe i have conceived my most brilliant plan to date yeah but uh uh and then of course when i was uh you know i've talked about this ucc guy i met back in springfield and we were you know he goes well the church is trinitarian I got a bad feeling about this. You know, and the guy, they, you know, I was there with a group of students, and one of the students said, well, what do you, I mean, it was sharp enough to pick up what he said. And what do you personally believe? Yeah, we're in trouble. And he goes, let's go to my office and talk about it. I don't want to talk about it here. We were down the sanctuary, and yeah, he just, no, he didn't want any chance anybody was going to hear that, no, he was basically Unitarian. Uh, and well on his way, probably being atheist. Yeah. So so here's the question they're posing. All right. What happens to a pastor who, for whatever reason, has has lost his faith, has thrown away his faith? You just pick your, you know, your verb. OK. Um, he's in a, he's in a bind. OK. Now, just sort of thinking of myself, if, if, if I ended up in that boat and, you know, I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, I certainly hope it doesn't. And, um, and I, it's, it's something that I don't, you know, spend a lot of time worrying about, but, uh, all right. You know, you talk about repercussions. All right. For one, I'd lose my job, which would also mean I'd lose my home. Okay. Um, my wife's a Christian and your health insurance. Yeah. And I would lose my health insurance. So we'll see how things work out tonight. (laughs) Um, I would, uh, looks like Jim's frozen again. Um, but it would be pretty tough on, oh no, you're back. <laughs> you're frozen. Um, it would be tough on my family. Um, I wasn't because, frozen. You were frozen. Oh, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens in the, you know, <laughs> when we see the final video there. Okay. Um, go ahead. Since I'm recording, <laughs> um, it would be hard on my family. And, and I don't know what would happen with my marriage, uh, because I, my wife is a Christian. My kids are Christians. I don't think they would respect me a whole lot if I, um, if I renounce this thing that really is, is the foundation of our family. Um, right. you know, it, it would just, so what do you do if you find yourself in that situation? You know, it's easy to say, well, 
you know, go back to the Bible and keep studying because then, you, you know, God will reveal the truth to you. Well, that's all fine and good, but I'm sure that these guys, you know, that this wasn't something that they took lightly, you know, and, and just came to a snap decision. We had a glitch there, folks. I'm not exactly sure uh, of everything, but I was quoting this this article, and I love the way this guy puts it. He says, uh, there has to be some wiggle room there. Some of these guys never would have gotten through seminary. And, uh, and then the other ones say, you find disingenuous circumlocutions that get you through Sunday morning without telling any outright lies. Yeah. Nice. In other words, they, they kind of dance around the fact that they really don't believe this without really out coming out and saying they don't really out, don't believe it. But on the other hand, not saying that they do either. Mm hmm. What do, you, what do you preach? When you don't believe it? Oh, you preach good works. You preach, you know, be a good person, be a good neighbor, and, and all that kind of stuff. You just don't talk about the cross. I know plenty of fundamentalist churches that that's what they do. That they, you know, they may talk about Jesus, but they mostly talk about Jesus as a um, community planner, you know? Um, fundamentalist or liberal? Fundamentalist. Really? That very little, you know, it's it's all about, uh, really, they don't talk about Jesus a whole lot at all. And it's just, or, or more from a sort of what would Jesus do um, kind of perspective. That um, that it's, it's more focused on, um, you know, here's how Jesus would have you live. And, um, and let's follow his example and, and stuff like that. And, and there's not a lot of emphasis on the cross. Oh, behave. And, uh, yeah, but that's lousy gospel. Uh, uh, I mean, what do you do? What do you preach that we don't believe at all? I mean, you know, you're. You preach this is what Jesus taught, and so this is what you do. Honestly, I don't think that it's going to end up sounding much different. I'll bet you I could find, you know, if I had time, which I don't, so, you know, if somebody else wants to. Um, See if you can find this or, or, or prove me wrong for that matter. But, um, I mean, I'll bet you that, that I could find, uh, um, sermons from, from fundamentalists that I could hand to one of these non believing pastors that they could preach just fine without compromising anything. All right. Except for maybe, you know, references to God. Because there's probably references to God. But references to Jesus, the divinity of Christ, you know, the Trinity and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've heard plenty of fundamental sermons that made no reference to that. You know, just talking about how you should be. And they're all law. And you know what? The law does not need, you know, ultimately um, you can preach the law pretty easily without God. What makes Christianity unique is not the existence of God or not, but the gospel, which of course is dependent on the existence of God and on Jesus being God. But, um, but you know, can you, can you preach what a lot of people will call Christian sermons, uh, without God, without mentioning God or, or Jesus being God or anything like the resurrection, anything like that? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't call him Christian. Um, but you'll hear him in Christian churches. We're in trouble. True. You know, it's something to think about. People out there, you know, listen to your pastor's sermons and see what they sound like. Pastors, you know, what do your sermons sound like? Do they sound Christian? Look, you know, look at the, today is Sunday, but look at the, the most recent few sermons that you preached. You know, are these sermons that, that a non-believing athe atheist pastor, um, Oh, that was redundant. But um, is that is that something that that they could preach in good conscience? You know, if it is, you need to change something. You know, um, now, I, don't, I don't think an atheist could have preached mine today. So, um, yeah, mine either. I had I had fun. It was um, preached on that Old Testament reading, and it was called it Exodus three. God's grace continues. Oh, I, I yeah. preached on this psalm. It was, it was really fun because it was this psalm of, of joy and, and like sort of um, waking up from a bad dream kind of thing or whatever. And, and um, which it, it's this really joyful psalm, 
and it's right smack in the middle of Lent, you know. <laughs> and, and so, you know, talked about, you know, um, and it was fun. And it's, it'll be online by the time you see this if anybody wants to hear it. Um, you know, Good. Find it. Good. Um, well, okay. It's one thing to not believe in God. Another thing is that what do we believe about Christ? Um, and uh, so this uh, guy, he's a professor at uh, Penn State, Edwin Early. He's a professor of humanities. He also, by the way, was on, uh, he also uh, is a professor or something also at Baylor University, which is, uh, of course, a Baptist uh, school. And uh, he's written a book, The Jesus Wars, How Four Patriarchs, Three Queens, and Two Emperors Decided What Christianity Would Believe for the Next 1,500 Years. And he documents the uh, the, the feuds in the uh, uh, at the Council of Ephesus, Ephesus in 431 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Uh, now, at first, I thought this might be dealing with the end of... Uh, um, uh, of Arianism, but really, I think he's dealing with the doctrine of uh, Eutychism, Eutychism, Eutychism here, or monophysism. Okay. Uh, that that the view that was lost, the view that was lost, was the one nature view, the idea of Christ, in which the human nature was totally overwhelmed by divinity. Um, and the idea being there, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of like. If you take a, it'd be like putting a drop of water in a in a, uh, a five gallon bucket, a, a drop of Kool Aid in a five gallon bucket. It would be overwhelmed. It you know would just dissipate. You couldn't see it anymore. Now I'm trying to figure out which 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 exact heresy that is. Give me a second. I will be able to tell you. Okay. Um, so basically, his while well, Jim's looking that up for verification, um, basically what what he's claiming is that really what it came down to is more sort of political decisions. What you know, what we would say to see today is you know sort of politicians going with the lobbyists and you know and things like that, where they're not making decisions based on conscience; they're making decisions based on you know what's sort of uh, for them or what their friends are doing or you know or something like that. Um, okay, it's not to say that these guys didn't have the, the, these emperors and these others didn't have a whole lot of influence in this in this whole thing, mm -hmm. but that's not why the church decided what the church decided. Yes, I'm I'm right because if that if he's right on that comment, yeah, it is monophysites. Each, uh, for example, the Eutycheans. Uh Jesus cannot have two natures. His divinity swallowed up his humanity like a drop of wine in the sea. I mean, I knew I had that uh, figured out. Uh, and they often pointed to Colossians one nineteen, for God was to ple pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, that God's fullness dwelt in Jesus, and that overwhelmed the human nature. Uh, and, and, and this, by the way, I mean this got these were not easy arguments. If you if you want to have some stuff to really, uh, really you know just wrap your head around, it is these early Christological controversies that took place up through the fifth century. Mm -hmm. um, beginning with Arianism in 325, uh, up through that, you get in this highly technical language. Uh, a lot of it's not biblical language. They borrow from philosophy. So you get the, 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 the mm -hmm. in the Nicene Creed, Jesus being one substance with the Father. Yeah. A lot of debate uh, over that word. Homoousius. Uh, uh, homoousius versus homoousius. It was the famous mm -hmm. heresy, uh, you know, discussion over a diphthong. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's so what you ended up with there is um, New Jersey lost out. So. Yeah. <laughs> You're from Jersey? I'm from Jersey. What accent? Anyway, so uh, they, they, they uh, it, it's, uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 now I haven't read his book. I'd like to be able to read the book. I mean, because it sounds like he, he, he really deals with this. Uh, uh, historically, uh, and probably does a, a, a real good job. But again, you know, the view that lost, well, I'm not sure it's a view that lost, you know, because the Orthodox Church really, you know, okay, there was this stuff, but they really asked the question, what is, what does Scripture say? Right. Right. So, yeah, it, it it's, it's really, you know, if you want to sell books, <laughs> you know, sort of do like like Dan Brown and, and sort of make it out to be this big conspiracy 
and that um that oh it was it was really close and you know and it could have gone either way and you know so, no no that's not the way it was all right yeah there was some debate over these things and and uh, you know there were people on both sides and they were kind of hashing through all this stuff but you got to understand that what they were doing if you go back and read that stuff they were digging into scriptures and they were using philosophy to try and explain these things all right mm -hmm. um mostly as more of like analogies and and trying to find human words to describe an infinite god all right um to to sort of take all of these concepts because in and somebody pointed this out to me that you know boy you know it sure would be nice if if god had had laid out the trinity nice and clean for us in the bible you know is it is does the the bible teach the trinity yes absolutely all right but is it written as a textbook sort of thing that that we can just very very easily go oh yep you know right here three three persons one god you know and and, and all that kind of stuff yeah, it's, it, you know, it's clear, but it's not like you can chapter and verse it, you know? It's There's, more, it's more inference. Yeah, and, but it's, know, all, it's, it's all there. It's all there, but it's, it's, you know, otherwise, you you know, just, just, you know, the way things are described, because it describes, you know, attributes to the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit, all the same attributes, but still, it is a little tricky. Mm -hmm. um, he asks the question, he goes, it makes you wonder. If it was worth pulling Christianity apart. Ah, don't do that. And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Uh, number one, you have to ask, what is the Orthodox faith? There's a, there's a problem. Jesus either has a full, is either fully human and fully divine, which is the Orthodox faith. Two natures and one person. Or he only has one nature that got, you know, swallowed up. Or there were two natures that are next to each other, like uh, uh, two boards glued together, which is what Nestorius taught. Um, <clears throat> or there was, uh, 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 you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, it can't be all three. Right. And you can't have three pastors in three different churches teaching three absolutely different things. And and all saying that, you know, that we agree and that we all believe the same thing you know ultimately those are three different gods or you know and, you, and there's there's been so many my, my favorite is modal monarchianism which is sort oh, of yeah. like um like the uh the, the old he-man character manny faces that oh. um <laughs> that you know the face changes and you know it's it's sort of that god wears these different masks um and mm -hmm. and operates under different modes and um right so, but no, um, that doesn't work. Right. Um, and of course, that, 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 that of course, the uh, Jesus only Pentecostals are, uh, right. modal monarchists. Uh, right. yeah, there's three different modes. Uh, or I say God wears, you know, it's God just wears a different hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of like I'm a, a father and a pastor and a husband all at the same time, you know. But right. no, that's, that's not it because they're distinct persons. And it's important that they're distinct persons. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, you get into this stuff. Uh, excellent, excellent resource. Um, if you happen to have, have a membership to the Christianity Today Library, was issue, I think, I believe it's 49 of uh, their uh, magazine, Church History. Uh, up, volume 15, number 3, issue number 51, fall 1996. Uh, and it... Uh, 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 was on early Christian thought about Jesus, uh, the Christological controversies. And I'll tell you, I read that issue, and that's where um, they had this really c cool graphic that uh, summarizes everything. And uh, I use it in my class. That's why I happen to have all this stuff real right at hand. I can just grab it up and, and, and have it right there. Um, but, I mean, it really does. Even, even though they try to make it as easy to understand as possible, your head still swims trying to figure this stuff out. You can imagine how their, their head swim doing it yeah but it is you know to to be honest it was you know it was not purely theological there were some political agendas in this as well i mean that uh, we've always admitted that i mean that goes back to the council of um nicaea uh which was called by the emperor because he wanted his uh, empire uni unified he didn't want this religious controversy going on 
Well, if there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. The um, I, I thought that was interesting. You know, this question was it worth pulling Christianity apart, and, and the you know the simple answer is not only yes, but it was already obviously divided. The point of these debates was to unify, not to you know to further divide. And you know, if if you say that this divided, it, no, you know, it's just admitting that there's a division there. So let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. And and he actually asks um, or he ma- makes a comment. Uh, this is sort of the conclusion of the book. Um, that he says, a religion that is not constantly spawning alternatives and heresies has ceased to think and has achieved only the peace of the grave. And, and I, and I thought about that and it, you know, it sort of sounds like, like there's this article kind of talks about, you know, religion evolving and things like that. And, you know, and if, if it's teachings are changing, then, well, you know, if, if you don't have continuity, then that really calls into question the teaching of your church, you know, if, if they're changing all the time, unless you're a Mormon, because their God can change his mind. But, um, most churches, no, you, you just lost your continuity. You, you know, and it's sort of like when, um, they said, Luther, do you, uh, do you believe what the Pope teaches? And he says, which one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> cause they've contradicted each other. And, um, you know, but at the same time, because we are not a cult, right? We do allow people to think, right? People to ask questions. Uh, my daughter was talking to somebody on Facebook, and and she said, you know, this person was actually is an atheist now. It used to be um, going to seminary to be a pastor, and what it came down to was um, he would ask questions, and was told those are forbidden questions. You're not allowed to ask those questions. And finally he said, well, I've got questions and you're not giving me answers. And so that calls everything into question. All right. And, you know, and so she was talking to him about how, you know, that's not right. You know, you should be, you should think and you should ask questions and, and stuff like that because that's how you grow in your understanding. And yeah, there's some things that, you know, that we don't have good answers. Um, you know, you talk about the, uh, the, the why some not others question um, is is a real difficult one to just because it's it's kind of beyond our comprehension um, or the Trinity for that matter. It's we can only go so far with that too before we have to stop and right. say, uh, you know, <laughs> I can't explain this any better than you know. We only have like a professor that I had uh, at seminary that said, uh, you know, if you, if you ask uh, Norman Nagel, uh, he he said if if you ask a question, the Bible doesn't answer it; it's the wrong question. He's not saying you're not allowed to ask it, but there may be questions where if the Bible doesn't answer it, we as humans can't attempt, you know, to to answer it if if the answer is not in the Bible and it's a question about God. All right. Um, but because the simple reality is, is that God hasn't revealed everything about himself. Um, he's revealed to us what we need to know. And, you know, so but because people are constantly asking questions and, and thinking about this stuff that there's going to be times where people just because they miss something or, you know, they're just looking at it from a, from a different perspective, they're going to kind of go off in a tangent somewhere, right? Or they're going to overemphasize one teaching over another or something like that. Right. And, and, and yeah, it, I'm not saying that, you know, that sort of false teachings within the church are good, but at the same time, it, by dealing with those, we grow in our understanding because the creeds aren't just, this is what I believe. They're also, this is what I do not believe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it helps you to uh, think this through theologically. I mean, you know, we, we need to think this through sometimes. It's what does the Bible teach? What does the faith say? How can I deal with this? Uh, very important for us to deal those kinds of questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not be afraid of them, and not be afraid either. Then, when somebody you know says, "Well, I, I disagree with you," or "This is what I think," so uh, anyway, let's uh, move on then to our last one. Um, Talk about people not allowed is, to not allowed to talk about what they believe. <laughs> yeah, really. This I know, that's what's a sad story. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, especially for oh. Jim and me both being involved in the sort of, um, in at least in the past, in the, the whole foster adopt program and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, seeing this was really just kind of broke my heart. But um, it's in Morocco. Uh, there have been uh, Christians from outside of Morocco that have been running an orphanage for 10 years. It's called the Village of Hope, and it's on the slopes of Morocco's Middle Atlas Mountains. And they just, it's abandoned Moroccan children. They bring them in, they raise them in their homes. And the Moroccan government now, says, the people no, no are more. Christian, but they do send the kids to Lord the Quran and everything. Yep, because that's the Moroccan law. It's a Muslim um, government. And so they they obey the government even though that means that they've got to um they've got to teach the kids stuff that um that goes contrary to their beliefs right now they they have you know expelled or told one or two a year that you've got to go because of this but this time it's a this it, the sheer quantity of deportations is unprecedented uh, there's a ton of them just being forced to leave uh, you know, here we, you know, you've done your work here. We're pulling your, um, uh, right to run these orphanages any longer. Um, and they were kind of like, you know, what about the kid? You know, who knows? Yeah. Uh, one guy said, uh, you know, he's worked at the orphanage. He has worked at the orphanage. It says here for 51 years. Uh, okay. So some, or maybe, maybe that's transposed. Maybe it should be 15. But they said, do you know the Quran? And they quoted the Quran to them. So he, you know, these people asked and, you know, they, these kids could do it. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I, there, there's this, this quote in here that really kind of floored me. Uh, it says, the Moroccan government today, uh, deals harshly with whoever allows themselves to manipulate the religion of the people. Um, Cited government crackdowns on radical Islamist groups and expulsions of Shia Muslims proselytizing in this largely Sunni country. Okay. Um, and that's the Moroccan communication minister, Khalid uh, Naori. And um, so he's saying, look, it's, it's not just Christians. It's others, too. But look at what he's saying. The government deals harshly with whoever allows themselves to manipulate the religion, the religion of the people. Isn't that what the government is doing <laughs> by saying what can and can't be taught? Hey, God bless, brilliant. Just saying. <laughs> just, just, well, that's just that's kind of hypocritical. Well, there. from our perspective, yes, but okay, um, you know, but it's a state church, therefore the state is, you know, saying that. I mean, it's. Um, I, I just got in the discussion about. With this guy, um, you may want to edit the section out. I don't know. Uh, on, on Luther's view of the Jews, and one of the things I tried to understand is it's not racial with him, and in his unfor very unfortunate tract on Jews and their lies, um, but it was religious, and there was you know no separation church and state, and he felt it was in you know they taught works, and therefore their religion should be disallowed within Christian Germany. And they should be packed up and moved if they don't want to become Christian. It's not that different from what they're saying here. Hmm. Now, unfortunately, tolerance, pluralism, uh, coexistence doesn't seem to, you know, really exist in either one's thought. <laughs> Somehow I don't think I'll be welcome at the country club. Um, and I think if they're both equally sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And now we'll, we'll leave that in because I mean, you know it's it's worth noting. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just let people believe what they believe. You know, it's, it's this whole atheist pastor thing. You know, it's a little more complicated right, because of the sort of personal um, aspect of it. But um. <sighs> For I don't know, anytime the government tells people what you're allowed to believe, what you're not allowed to believe, or what you're allowed to teach, and and stuff like that, you just you're not 
benefiting. Just like we said, you know, let people ask questions because then, you know, that allows you to really think through your beliefs. If, if your belief system is that weak that it can't hold up to criticism, it's not worth holding to, you know, I mean, we're just, um, we're, we've been doing a study at, at our church on, uh, looking at atheist arguments against Christianity. Right. And we're taking, we've taken a document that was written by an atheist that's just ripping into the Bible and we're going through and looking at it. Right. I'm not afraid of his, of what he has to say. Right. And, and we're looking at it and, and we're trying to, you know, there was something tonight that he said that sort of at face value, we went, Oh, this is ridiculous. Okay. Well, what did he really, what was he really trying to say? So we're, we're trying to really hear him out. I mean, the guy's been dead for a hundred years, so we can't ask him. Um, so if anybody's interested, uh, shepherd of the ridge dot org, the, um, we're audio recording it so you can, um, listen in on right. the conversation, but, um, you know, let, you know, keep bring bring your your dis, your uh, arguments or or your criticisms and that, and we'll talk about it. You know, but anytime they say no, nope, not allowed to talk about it and stuff like that. Well, that really, what does that say about your religion? So I don't know. I not ever having lived in a country with a state church, I imagine that there's also sort of social elements to this and you know that you don't want unrest and things like that but um you know if if you tell people well let's you know like the bible says speak the truth in love um then we should be able to to get through this so i agree i don't think we need to be afraid um but these guys unfortunately uh don't see it that way there's not much we're going to be able to do about it which is a sad thing, but it's kind of where we're stuck. And I just feel bad for the kids they were taken care of. Because basically it says the kids aren't important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, um. Okay, we got some feeder re uh, 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 feedback last time, yep. which was really nice. Um, I'm going to do the uh, nicer one. I'll let you do the <laughs> Um. And one is from a um, guy who said, just started listening and he enjoys the banter. So I guess that's our interplay. Uh, and uh, um, he says, um, he asked, uh, on our, we said, for what about social justice in churches? He says it's important to make a distinction that in most cases of the Bible, God commands his people to take cert certain action, like the care for the poor mentioned the podcast, but that doesn't mean the secular government is commanded to take that same action. My issue with social justice is not from the church perspective, but from the government perspective. And the United States Constitution mandates what the government is responsible for, and social justice is not one of those things. The government may be doing it now, but that was not the intent of the framers. So I guess I would agree with Glenn Beck, but not because the church should be getting involved in social justice. Should not be. That the government should not be. Oh, should not be getting involved in social justice, but the government should not be involved in social justice. From a practical perspective, why would anyone think a bureaucrat in some government capital can do the best job of knowing the needs of local people and applying the right justice? I also think a bad idea for federal government because of the overhead and inefficiency will not do a good job of getting the right job done. Uh, well, brother, I'm going to tell you, 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 you really do reflect a lot of my own thinking there. Uh, <clears throat> I think next week we'll probably be talking about health care and probably about the destruction of the pro-life Democrats. Um. <laughs> you know, I was I was watching, I was on uh, Ustream today because we're thinking about um, switching over to that for our live streaming of our services. And um, and they had, uh, CBS was doing, uh, using Ustream to do a live feed um, of from Congress where, the, where they're hashing through all this. All right. And, uh, and there was, there's one guy that got up and I, it was sort of playing in the background, but it was interesting listening. And he was saying, he was talking about the, the um, the, 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 what's the law that says that the, the government can't pay for, um, abortions. The Hyde Amendment. Yeah, that it, that's it. And, um, 
And he's, uh, he says, you know, besides the Hyde Amendment, he says, I've, I've spoken with my priest about this, and I am not willing to jeopardize my eternal salvation for the sake of this bill. <laughs> so I just thought that was funny that I just happened to hear that during the discussion. But, I, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Maybe we will next week. Um, we'll see. But, uh, but Mike, thank you. Uh, for that note, it was just a really well um, thought out note. Really appreciate that. Love hearing from um, from people. And uh, and I also this I mean this literally just came in uh, a couple hours ago um, on YouTube, and it says uh, it's funny. The last thing that you say is that you don't have many subscribers to begin with. It would appear that you won't be getting many more this week, but. Um, for the one minute, 26 seconds, you have really great sound. What kind of mics do you use? <laughs> we use, these are like $25. Um, uh, who makes these things? Altec Lansing. Um, and they're, uh, got them at like Best Buy or something like that. They're really cheap. Um, but they do the job. So, um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think what he was saying there that, you know, we won't have, won't be getting many more this week. Um, I, I think what he was probably referring to this was, was, uh, the cracks against, um, people that drink snail snot. So, <laughs> we didn't get any negative feedback on that. So apparently, well, you know, the, the Jedi guys actually, um, watched our show when we talked about them. Uh, which we appreciate. Um, the the people that were drinking snail mucus, um, they haven't gotten around to watching us yet. So, or else they just ignored us and said these guys are a bunch of jerks and <laughs> not going to pay any attention to them. So, um, I, I I do kind of feel bad about. I, I know it doesn't look like it, but I, I do kind of feel bad about being so derogatory last time. So. Even though they haven't approached us on it, I'm, I'm going to apologize anyway. I'm not. <laughs> I mean, it is ridiculous, but, you know, they really do believe that, so. All right. Okay, folks. Well, this is about the end of this whole thing this week. We pray God would watch over and bless you and keep you. And uh, have a good week as we enter the next to the last week of Lent. And next week, of course, we enter Holy Week. Yep. Yep. So, oh, so, um, just want to let everybody know we will not be having a, um, uh, uh, during, because we record this on Sundays. All right. We're not recording this Easter Sunday. So we're going to be taking a week off then. Uh, I'm not sure about the following week. So we might, you know, one or two weeks off. So that'd be a good time for our, our more recent uh, viewers and listeners to go back and watch some of our older episodes, but don't go back too far because the, you know, you talk about your sound is, is good. <laughs> Not in the old ones. It wasn't, <laughs> it was really bad. Oh <laughs> yeah, it was, but we've been working hard at it. We've been working hard. Yeah. So, yep. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in and, um, yep. really appreciate the comments. Keep them coming. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. So, Thank you, good night, and God bless. Bye-bye.